Um, good morning and good afternoon to everyone and welcome to today's webinar on the health system recovery and reconstruction in Ukraine. My name is Maria Bertone and I'm a reader at Queen Margaret University in Edinburgh and I'm also the vice chair for the thematic working group on um, health system in fragile and conflict affected setting. So I'm very excited today because this is the first um, webinar of our new webinar series called Talking Points um, that we are just launching um, today. And we're doing this webinar in collaboration with HSD Europe. Um, Goran will be joining us uh, very, very soon. So I wanted to very briefly introduce the TWG FCAS before um, letting our speaker um, talk today about the, the interesting case of Ukraine. So just um, very briefly, as many of you might know, the TWG FCAS is one of the 10 um, thematic working group of um, HSG, Health System Global, and it has been active since 2013. Today, um, it's a group of more than 2,000 members, and it aims to connect um, and engage a range of actors, including researchers, policymakers, donors, practitioners, um, health providers, educators, civil society, private sector, thinking and advancing the thinking on health system research in fragile and conflict affected settings. And we try to promote the networking uh, between people. So we hope that this webinar is also an occasion um, to meet others working in, in the same field and be able to, to link with them um, in the future through the TW2. Um, in terms of activities, we have a bi-monthly newsletter that was just relaunched. And so we encourage you to register in the LinkedIn group and the Google group to receive a newsletter. As I said, we're launching this uh, Talking Points webinar series. And if you have any ideas or want to share um, some, uh, some, a report or, a, or a, a reflection or a publication that just came out, do you want to set up one of these webinars? We're very happy to help you do that. So just get in touch with us. And we also organize a series of activities on three core themes. The first one, um, it, we call fragility revisited. As we know that the concept of fragility and term, the label is quite contested and a bit charged. So we want to rethink that and, uh, and revisit it um, in, in the future as we go along. And then the second theme is about health system and displacement, thinking about healthcare responses for refugee and migrants. And the third theme is about health system strengthening, uh, reflecting on the key principle of health system strengthening in fragile settings but also involving practitioner as much as possible to share their experiences. And uh, if you stay tuned with the newsletter, you'll have you will receive more information about the three themes and the activities, and you can join the working group. As I mentioned, um, the TWG um, communicates through different ways. We have a, an email, but we also have a LinkedIn group and a Google group, and you have a link there, and they will be shared um, with an active link, so you can you can click on those. And, and register. We really encourage you to, to register to both the LinkedIn and the Google group as uh, the, the LinkedIn is quite nice for kind of static information, but uh, Google group, we can, we can exchange and have um, debates and, and um, a bit more kind of uh, active communication. So, so that's it for today. And I hope that um, that has given you a little bit of an overview about the role and the work of a TWG FCA. And now I look forward to introducing the speakers for um, today's webinar. Um, and uh, we have um, quite a, an interesting lineup. And the focus today is in trying to explore the experiences of and the lessons learned from the health system recovery and reconstruction efforts in Ukraine, including in territories reclaimed from temporary Russian military control. So um, I will soon um, give the floor to Jarno Hab Habkik who is the WHO representative and the head of country office in Ukraine. And then we will have two case studies looking at the reconstruction of clinic in Makariv and Malarohon by the Kiev School, School of Economics and Patients of Ukraine. And I will introduce the speaker when we get there. Um, and then um, Katerina Fishkuk of the WHO office in Ukraine and Mark Hellowell of the University of Edinburgh will share some reflection and some lessons learned based on the, those two case studies, but also other case studies that they have recently conducted in Ukraine. Hopefully we will have about half an hour for a, a Q&A with the audience. And, and then uh, Goran from HSG Europe will, will have some closing remarks. Um, in terms of Q&A, um, if you can please use the Q&A box at the, at the bottom of the Zoom um, screen, that will be great. I will be collecting questions and then asking them uh, to the um, to the panelists. 
And if there is any uh, burning issue or if for some reason you want to share a reflection, you would like to raise your hand and have the mic activated, we can also do that if there is time. So again, thank you very much for participating today. Very uh, exciting to be here. And I will just give the floor um, to Yarno, the WHO representative of, uh, uh, in Ukraine, um, to start with some reflection and overview of the impact of the war and the recovery needs in Ukraine. Over to you, Yarno. Thank you, Maria. And I hope everybody uh, hears me well. I hope I'm seen also on the screen. And uh, I like to welcome everybody. Uh, good morning to good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are, or if you are uh, following some of the recordings also later on. So I will uh, talk about three matters in the beginning uh, because uh, there is much to say, but I will try to be focused. One is what WHO has been learning when we work in Ukraine and where we focus, especially we ought to look 18 months now since Russian Federation invasion on 24th of February 2022 to Ukraine. Then I will say a few aspects about the impact of the war just to highlight and illustrate what colleagues will then follow up um, in their um, uh, presentations. And then I would like to have a, a, a third block to have a link between what we see um, in the recovery and how we should link actually the recovery process to the previous reform um, um, initiatives as well adapting to the system. So let me start quickly on, on three aspects I wanted to cover. So first, what we have learned during the full-scale war is that Ukraine has enormous capacity to manage the health system. And while what we saw in the beginning, uh, in February and March, a lot of the focus was really on responding, saving lives. We saw millions of Ukrainians leaving the country, uh, millions of displaced, and currently we have more than 7 million outside of Ukraine, and almost the same amount who have been moving away from their homes, homes that don't exist anymore in, uh, in um, cities like Mariupol or homes um, who, uh, where there are no windows and heating like in center of Kiev or other places. So what we have seen is a huge impact in the first beginning of the war. But very soon, uh, when I go back to April, May 2022, a lot of the discussion started to be how we recover, what we will see um, as a fast recovery. And we were visiting with WHO Director General, uh, Dr. Tedros Makariv, um, where we are one of the case studies um, um, today. And I remember the feelings where we saw the primary care center, which had got direct hit and literally did not exist. And today, one year later, we have the primary care center existing. So this was something that nobody believed in April, May 2022, but that's a very important that while we are working on responding to the war and humanitarian crisis, at the same time, recovery can happen. And this was something that's very much learned from 2022. But then the third aspect we have been looking at as a WHO is there are reforms that started in the health system in 2016 that need to continue equally at the same time. So for us, the first message and lesson learned in 18 months um, in supporting Ukraine to respond to the war and invasion by Russian Federation is we need to simultaneously work at the time on response, recovery and the reforms at the same time. And this is unique because in very many other settings, we are looking those three aspects as linear. And in Ukraine, it is not linear. It happens at the same time. And this is one of the key lessons I, I think we need to learn also from Ukraine. The second I wanted to cover is the impact of war. And only a few examples as we will more focus on the recovery today. As a WHO, we have monitored, validated and reported 1,129 attacks on health. This means lost lives of the nurses and doctors. It means lost ambulances, many of the primary care centers, many of the hospitals that have been hit not once, but several times. So this is a huge amount of attacks on health. And when we look the first 12 months uh, since full-scale invasion, in the whole world, 
all attacks on health in Ukraine counted more than 75% of all attacks on health worldwide. So we need to understand also the scale, uh, what that number means. And that is something that happens and continues to happen. But still, the health system is functioning. And when we look to the latest health needs assessment that WHO has been carrying out regularly every quarter, we see that the overall level of care is good. Of course, it varies, as it varied also at the time of COVID and before. Ukraine is a big country. I, I just last month had a tour uh, just to go to a few oblasts, and it counted 3,000 kilometers. So um, just to go around, it takes weeks. Uh, so we need to understand also that the situation varies. But on average, actually, the health needs are addressed. Maybe two aspects to highlight. One is access to care close to the front line is more difficult. And I can witness going beyond 29 minefields to reach to the primary care center where still children and adults and elderly are going to visit the primary care doctor and nurse. And it is not easy to get there, but the doctors are there and the patients are there but, and the care is provided, but it's not easy and very many places where public transport is not available. So close to the contact line and nine oblasts out of uh, 25 where uh, um, um, active um, war goes on, um, care is less uh, uh, available. And the second aspect that uh, is also seen is for the internally displaced, those who are in the Western oblast, for example, primary care sometimes is less accessible, maybe because they don't know where to find their doctor. So we see um, also a bit of the access issues for the IDPs, but overall the care, the access to care is good. And when we look to the facilities, WHO just finished the HIRAM study, which looks to the functionality of facilities, we see that the 95, 96% of all public facilities are fully functional. So in a sense, we have all more than 1,000 attacks on health. We have health needs which are addressed. However, there are groups who need better access to care, and it is also related to how to have access to medicines, for example. But overall, the public system really functions. And now this brings me to the third topic I wanted to cover, what we have been looking and to lead a little bit into the discussion that uh, colleagues will have is really what we then did in April, May after 2022, uh, when we saw that we need to work in response, in recovery and reforms at the same time. As a WHO, we consulted with many of the colleagues and partners, and we came up with a publication which is Principles for the Recovery. And this led to the discussions that happened in Lugano when we go back to June 2022, and Lugano had the um, Ukraine reform slash recovery conference, where many didn't yet understood that recovery can happen now. But in the health sector, we felt as WHO and many of the colleagues, we need to get those principles in place. Because when many actors, humanitarian and development, who are saving lives, supporting Ukraine, start to recover, uh, invest to the recover uh, recovery, it might not actually follow the reforms that Ukraine envisaged in 2016-17, uh, uh, starting from health financing, digitalizing health, et cetera, et cetera. So that principles paper is here and my good colleague Katerina has also shared the link. And then from there, a lot of questions start be, were there, but where to what to address in the short run? So in December, just between the Christmas and New Year, we came up a separate, separate paper, which is about the uh, priorities for the short-term recovery, which is a joint paper of the World Health Organization, the World Bank, the USAID and EU, where to focus in health. Because we saw that it is very important not just throw money to the recovery, and the needs are huge. The rapid damages and needs assessment shows that in the health sector, we need $16.4 billion in, for the next 10 years to recover. But where to put your money first? And there, um, that paper is useful for many partners and examples here by colleagues on primary care, et cetera, are exactly what needs to happen. And these are a few of the examples uh, from that paper, prioritize the primary care. This is really important for people who are returning to home 
That was something I saw in Irpin and Bucha in April, May last year. People, when they went back to gardening, to, see the, to look after demining their houses, they, what they really needed was primary care, medicines, and the shop to buy food. And then they were actually starting to restore their hope and homes. So that's why primary care is important because it allows people to go back and start the basic care. But then there are other two aspects which are very important. Continuously invest to the public institutions and Ukraine capacity, which is in the lead role of response. As well, don't rebuild everything because Ukraine inherited huge infrastructure of healthcare and doing a recovery does not mean that we need to actually restore all the old infrastructure. This is an opportunity to move Ukraine healthcare infrastructure to this century with an accelerated mode. And this is something that we have seen also during the wartime. We have done much more work in an accelerated way on the physical rehabilitation, in mental health, in many other areas, which is important. Don't rebuild everything as it was before 24th of February 2022. There is much that can be done differently that helps Ukraine to be in the different place. And that is very much, I think, where um, we need now the inspiration that the colleagues are giving. Uh, this was very much in the center of the Ukraine Recovery Conference in London uh, a few months ago, that actually recovery happens now. And the, it needs to happen also in the healthcare. And health is one of the priorities among the five priorities of the government as part of the critical social infrastructure. So I will stop here. And the final note really is recovery is not only about physical buildings. Recovery means also knowledge. Recovery means the healthcare workers Recovery means human capital, that Ukraine can prosper um, after um, uh, the war um, as it is moving forward at the time of war. So thank you for the opportunity to share. And uh, I'm sorry if I took a bit more time, but really uh, this uh, is a topic I, I gets me always excited. Kaita knows that they need to limit myself when I get to discuss about recovery and reconstruction of Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was excellent and uh, completely on time. So that's good. And uh, it, it really gave us a, a, a perfect background to start the discussion, just the general overview um, and quite compelling of a picture. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so I think I will uh, now turn to uh, Marina, Marina Borisenko, who is the project lead um, at the, uh, of the Rebuilt Ukraine um, at the um, Kiev Skill School of Economics Foundation. So over to you, Marina, if you have slides to share, um, you can share them now. And Marina is going to present one of the case studies um, uh, looking at the reconstruction of a Makariv clinic. Over to you, Marina. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you very much for your invitation. And thank you very much for your interest to Ukraine and Ukrainian people. We really appreciate it. You know, we uh, often hear that uh, Europeans and Americans, they are tired of the war of Ukraine. And I, I understand that it's it's not your war, yeah? it's not the problems of your people, but we really appreciate that uh, one and a half year of the world and uh, of the war, and you are still with us and you are interested and you are um, engaged and you are eager to help us. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, first of all, I'd like to emphasize that um, KS, uh, KSC Foundation, it's a private foundation. And uh, before the war, we have never operated professionally in the healthcare sector. Uh, the XC Foundation is a part of Kiev School of Economics family, which consists of uh, Kiev School of Economics University, uh, Kiev School of Economics um, Institute, and uh, actually the XC Foundation. By the way, uh, previously you were talking about this plan of recovery of Lugano, and our KSC Institute was the one who wrote, uh, who helped our government to make all the analytics and all the re research on this. Um, recovery schemes. Uh, so before the war, uh, before, before the big war, from the um, uh, we um, operated in the um, as an uh, educational fundraiser 
for our university uh, to pay the scholarships to our students, uh, faculty members, and uh, talented individuals. Uh, here is our the building of our university, our students, the um, university institute and the foundation. Uh, but um, during the first year of the full-scale uh, intrusion, uh, we made uh, every effort uh, to provide the maximum support and uh, to state um, to our state and our citizens. Uh, in the beginning of the war, uh, we got a request from the Ministry of Health uh, that they needed uh, 300,000 of medical kits and uh, we supported with the uh, 10% of all these needs. Uh, this, this, this was needs for the whole country, for the whole Ukraine. So we've supported, uh, you can see the amount we fundraised. It's uh, almost four and a half million dollars. And we really provided um, uh, 38,000 first aid kits. And um, they were purchased and they were the, delivered to our soldiers. Um, as, um, as a result, uh, we were recognized as a reliable and capable partner. And um, we started, we continued to work in the uh, healthcare sector. Uh, also, we focused our um, attention on providing uh, local assistance to the hospitals, as you can see on these slides. Uh, now we work with five hospitals, one in Winnitsa, one in Kropivnitsky, and two hospitals in uh, Kharkiv region and Dnipro regions. Uh, we provide them with uh, the equipment, uh, we provide them with the needed uh, medication, medications according to uh, their request. Uh, also, I would like to mention that for today, uh, there is a really big need and request from the government for uh, rehabilitation uh, centers and cabinets for our soldiers that were injured during the war. And... Um, just uh, last week, we've launched um, a project with um, rehabilitation cabinets. These are not like big uh, rehabilitation centers. They are uh, they cost too much. But we launched the project with uh, repairing and um, and buying equipment uh, to the cabinets in hospitals that can provide the services for uh, rehabilitation. Uh, speaking about um, uh, our uh, biggest case, I think it's uh, the reconstruction of some the outpatient clinic in Makariv. Uh, I would like to say that um, uh, we um, we really at the beginning of the war we were really scared, but uh, we were enough brain to put a big goal to start a big recovery project. Uh, it was really scared because um, the situation was unstable, but we wanted to show everyone that, uh, and we wanted to be a good example to show that uh, the reconstruction should be started uh, right here and right now, uh, because we didn't know how long the war would last, two or three years, and um, it was important to uh, start recovery. Uh, how did we, uh, why did we choose uh, this clinic specifically? Uh, on the 28th of March, this clinic was totally destroyed by the, you can see here on the photo, it is totally destroyed by the uh, uh, right um, missile hit. And it took just a couple of hours to be burned uh, totally. And uh, as you can see here on the photo, and um, it was um, our ambitious goal. And uh, for us, uh, uh, this uh, we chose. The, uh, there were many clinics destroyed, destroyed, but we chose this chose this location, uh, to this clinic because it had a good location for that time. First of all, we had good relations with the local gov government. That is very important when you make some uh, reconstruction projects. Uh, this territory was deoccupied, and we understood, uh, we, we um, knew that our soldiers uh, won't uh, let Russian troops again come to this territory, and uh, it was quite safe. 
and it was not close to the front line. And uh, the most, uh, one of the most uh, uh, important um, decisions was that um, this clinic, um, it was uh, one and it served to uh, 19,000 of uh, patients um, and uh, 4,000 of patients are children. And um, as we say that at that time, we were not fighting only for our territories, but we were fighting for our people. And uh, we understood that um, we, we wanted this territory was deoccupied and we wanted our people to come back to their homes. And we understood that uh, there, are, there are three key elements um, to make them come back home. First, it's, uh, and it's infrastructure. Uh, it's uh, shops, supermarkets, it's uh, schools for the children, education, and it's uh, hospitals. Um, our business, small business, recovered really quickly. And um, so we decided to invest in reconstruction of the hospital. And so one more important thing was that um, these clinics worked before and it had uh, 19 professional doctors working there. And we were afraid that uh, the more time these doctors spent on the western part of Ukraine, um, the quicker way, the, the quicker they will get accommodation accommodated to another cities and find job there at new places, more safe places. And we were afraid that these professionals won't come to this city. And even so, this was the reason we had to carry up because um, we could uh, reconstruct this clinic just for uh, the time could take like two and three years, but we were not sure that these doctors would come and work there. So we had to uh, make it as uh, quickly as soon as uh, possible. Uh, so in the beginning of April, we started our fundraising campaign. Uh, to tell you the truth, the fundraising campaign was really hard. Uh, because we needed uh, two, um, eight uh, thousand hundred, uh, eight hundred thousand dollars for the reconstruction, because as you can see on the photo, it was just totally destroyed, and uh, not um, all the donors were uh, actually. The European society and American society, they were at that time and politicians as well, they were not sure in the victory of Ukraine and they were not eager to um, donate to specifically to infrastructure and to recovery of infra infrastructure. But um, actually we managed to do this. Uh, so in, in April, we started fundraising. Uh, just in, uh, then we had uh, three, uh, three months of uh, preparing all the technical documentation, all the project. Uh, the project was validated uh, through different governmental uh, structures. And the uh, building uh, be, uh, became in, um, started in August. And so we thought that we will manage to do this in uh, half a year, uh, but unfortunately it took us uh, almost one year to um, finish the reconstruction. Uh, we the problems we've uh, met. Uh, the first was pro uh, the first problem was that uh, when we started the reconstruction, um, we've uh, gone in period like autumn and winter it, it was uh, uh, and there were not good um weather conditions to build so it took some more time to uh make all these works uh, outside because of the rainy weather and so on uh the next problem was uh with the logistics with the materials uh because it was uh, august it was september uh, not all the materials were available uh we had really problems for example with windows and glass we had to uh wait a really long time to mm, by the glass because um the there there was not enough uh, on the market of the glass and windows because the uh, country was under um rocket attacks and when the rocket comes uh, at one place hits at one place at the uh, perimeter of like uh, 500 meters all the windows 
uh, are broken and um, the demand on uh, these uh, glass and windows was uh, very big at that time. Uh, also, we had a problem that uh, the prices were very unstable. And uh, during the, uh, we've made, uh, um, I want to say previously that we'll have also a uh, tender where we choose the building company because it was for us, it was very important to um, all the procedures to be transparent. Uh, uh, and to, to be uh, donors to trust us and um, uh, the it was hard when every month the prices for the um, building materials were unstable and it was too hard to manage this uh, cost we've uh, had in the contract. Uh, also in the end of October as you remembered we had a lot of blackouts and this also had a negative impact on the terms. Uh, for example, if we uh, speak about um, manufacturing um, furniture, uh, uh, the reception and manufacturing furniture, uh, some companies, uh, our con uh, contractors had to work in night shift because the pressure in electricity in, in electricity system uh, was bigger at night. And when, and when they worked um, in the day, the machines uh, didn't uh, didn't work well. Um, and also the uh, problem was that one of the problem was that really many uh, men, uh, because builders in our country, it's not very high qualified personnel and many of builders were moved to the uh, front line. Uh, so, um, uh, on here you can see on the photos the rebuild. Here is the process. Here is the build, rebuild ambulatory, and um, here is even equipment already in the cabinets. And um, in um, May, uh, you can see here the uh, minister. Our Minister of Healthcare, he was present at the opening of this um, ambulatory. And here is our donor, donor wall. Um, and where, all, uh, where are all of our sponsors staying? So, if you maybe you have any questions or Thank I can you. add something. Thank you, thank you, Marina. This is this is great, and yeah, it really gives us a very very concrete case study of what happened and how you managed to, as Jarno was saying, to reconstruct as still without waiting, um, and uh, without waiting for the full end of the war and the recovery. But yeah, thank you very much. Um, I was wondering, I, I saw that there are some questions and someone raised their hands, but if that's okay, uh, perhaps we can go on to the next case study and then take the question afterwards. Um, if that's all right. Um, so that we can perhaps we can combine the question and, and maybe some have some reflection, comparative reflection and um, yeah, and some thoughts on that. So if that's okay, then I will um, hand over to Holga Zavadska of Patients of Ukraine. Olga, you can share your slides if you want to. And Olga is going to um, present the case study of a reconstruction of a clinic in Malahrovan, also an area that it was uh, taken back from uh, Russian military control. Thank you, over to you, Olga. Uh, thank you for opportunity to present uh, to all of you our work during the war. Uh, first of all, I want to say that uh, um, charitable fund Patients of Ukraine is uh, not just a building or rebuilding organization. Uh, we were uh, working uh, before war. Uh, before full-scale war, war for tw 12 years. And uh, we were fo focused on reforming the healthcare system and uh, system of public procurement of medicines. We have always fought to make medical treatment available to all patients, to all citizens of Ukraine. But with onset of Russian aggression, we have significantly expanded our activities and uh, launched powerful platform aimed at helping patients, including people with injuries, 
on basis of our foundation. So I will tell you about Mala Rahan uh, later and a few words about our activities. Uh, so what we are doing to uh, on rebuilding the healthcare sector at all? Uh, first, it's uh, procurement of uh, medicines and medical equipment for healthcare facilities uh, in the deoccupied and frontline areas and all over Ukraine. Uh, then uh, our uh, serious uh, significant area of work is uh, advocating for important change changes uh, uh, in building a uh, uh, sustainable and effective healthcare system. Uh, also, we are doing repair and rebuilding of destroyed healthcare facilities uh, because uh, it is really, um, uh, it uh, matters a lot to do it right now. And uh, also another stream of uh, our activities is developing uh, rehabilitation system. It's about physical rehabilitation, especially for those who are suffering from war trauma in Ukraine. Uh, so you can see funds uh, spent on the procurement and delivery of uh, different medicines, medical supplies, devices, and medical equipment uh, during full-scale uh, war in Ukraine. Uh, it's uh, 170 millions of uh, UA hryvnas. Uh, it's about uh, more than four and a half million uh, dollars, which made it possible to support the sustainable operation of healthcare facilities throughout Ukraine. Also, we uh, largely engaged in advocacy before Russia full-scale invasion. More than 2 million seriously ill Ukrainians needed medicines containing cannabis components. The number of such patients is in increasing daily during the war, in particular as a result of injuries, both physical and psychological. We successfully achieved that patients' needs were finally taken into consideration and the parliament supported the draft law. Uh, the second voting round is ahead. In addition to support uh, uh, for the medical cannabis uh, legalization, uh, patients of Ukraine also support the development of uh, medical self-governance and uh, the continuation of medical reform to make medical treatments more accessible during the war and after it. Uh, sorry, uh, so further. Uh, another stream is war trauma rehabilitation. Uh, we are involved uh, to formation and development of rehabilitation policies in Ukraine. We are providing trainings for rehabilitation specialists in modern international practices. And also we are equipping rehabilitation units throughout Ukraine with up-to-date equipment which they need. Uh, and now going to rehabilitation of healthcare facilities. Uh, I was involved to this process uh, very uh, deeply by myself. Uh, I uh, made uh, uh, 20 trips uh, during this year. Um, my uh, Google Maps uh, history told me that uh, it was about uh, 82 days in trips all around Ukraine. And um, I talked to many of uh, managers, uh, doctors, nurses, uh, and other staff of healthcare facilities, and also with uh, local inhabitants of uh, regions uh, which are frontline, pre-frontline, and uh, deoccupied regions. So uh, during this year, patients of Ukraine with the support of uh, international partners, uh, with the support of Crown agents and uh, International Rescue Committee has already made repairs. It's basic repairs, uh, repairs of roof, windows, uh, heating systems. Uh, uh, it was repairs of 35 healthcare facilities 
in the occupied regions of Ukraine. You can see the photos of them. Uh, it is from Kharkiv region, Sumy region, Dnipro region, uh, Kherson region. We were coming on uh, to that regions uh, right after the occupation and started our works. And here is the, is the case of uh, outpatient clinic in Malarohan. Uh, I'll show you a short video with, uh, it's my hand in a glove in uh, February, 2023. Uh, we completed all works in this clinic uh, from October, 2022 till uh, January, 2022. Uh, we uh, put uh, a new roof, uh, also replaced all damaged windows, rebuilt walls, uh, because it was significantly damaged, you can see uh, on a short video. Um, something went wrong. Uh. Uh, sorry, sorry, something went wrong with uh, screen sharing, but I'll try to um, turn it back. Uh, and we'll tell you about Malarohan. Uh, it's uh, the small town next to Kharkiv. It's like a suburb of uh, one million uh, uh, people's city. Uh, so I'll try to share screen again. Uh, and uh, it was uh, um, occupied by Russian army. Uh, right after full-scale invasion in um, February 2022. And uh, it was um, really a f um, soon re liberated, but uh, Russian army was very close uh, to this uh, city and uh, continue uh, to bomb and shell it. Um, sorry, something went wrong with my presentation. Uh, sorry, sorry. I'll uh, No worries, sharing. take your time. Yeah. And... Uh, so I will tell you without presentation further. Um, we uh, understand that uh, we are not just rebuilding uh, uh, walls. Uh, we are um, repairing uh, something like um, people's destinies, people's lives, because uh, I was communicating <laughs> to local people and uh, uh, lots of them uh, very um, um, inspired to return and to work in uh, their places. And uh, they are um, moving further and we are moving with them. So we are planning to uh, repair in this year 25 more uh, healthcare facilities and completely rebuild four of them uh, with uh, a completely renovation. Even uh, sometimes it's a completely new place uh, to build in uh, the healthcare facility in uh, the city. Uh, so uh, uh, I'll try to share with you uh, my um, uh, last slide. Just one little second. I'll share it with you. So we uh, understand that uh, uh, War always brings devastation and destruction, but it's important to, to keep life going. Therefore, we are not waiting for victory and ready to restore healthcare system. And we are doing it now. 
and we are uh, sincerely grateful to our international partners also uh, who also understand the need uh, uh, of uh, support and rebuild and also understand the need to build new but not restore old and uh, uh, not modern. And uh, we are going to uh, do more and more and we are keep going. Thank you uh, for ability to talk about this and to, to share this experience. Uh, maybe someone have any questions, I am ready to answer. Thank you, Olga. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you for dealing with your IT um, issues, but the presentation was amazing. And, and again, we, we saw enough um, of the videos and and pictures to get a get a better understanding. So thank you. Um, there are a few questions on the on the chat box, and perhaps we can take a couple of them that are addressed specifically to for to the two case studies um, before we move on to um, the reflections and uh, and then the rest of the of the questions. And specifically specifically for you, Olga, there was a question um, in terms of um, were you able or would you be able to expand. Um, a little bit on how you have been working with hospitals and clinics to integrate physical rehabilitation needs. You touched a little bit on that, so I wanted to ask you if you can expand that um, to, to follow up on that question. Yeah, of course. It is very large scope of work, as uh, you can imagine. <laughs> Uh, before the full-scale war, uh, our Ukrainian rehabilitation was um, more likely post-Soviet rehabilitation with uh, physiotherapy, which is not evidence-based methods. And uh, we are working a lot, uh, uh, first uh, on... Um, um, uh, on uh, expanding and... Um, enforcing expertise of uh, uh, professionals who are working with uh, uh, patients, with uh, uh, people after war trauma. And also uh, our uh, foundation is working uh, on uh, policies uh, and um, uh, on um, ways which uh, uh, physical rehabilitation had to be done in Ukraine. Uh, also, we are um, um, providing uh, trainings and now we are preparing large uh, event. Uh, it's uh, Congress of uh, Physical Therapists uh, to uh, force uh, their knowledge on this on this and to, to um, make uh, them uh, to give them ability uh, to exchange experience with uh, their international colleagues and between uh, them and I see question from Jarna uh, I am ready to answer yes over to you Jarna if you have a question I, I, I just wanted to add a little bit to what Olha was also mentioning on, on the physical rehabilitation and, and uh, three aspects uh, there, uh, or, or even four. I, I, I think one, when supporting Ukraine, we need to realize that Ukraine has agreed also the clinical pathways for the physical rehabilitation when it comes to amputations, spinal cord injuries, burns, so what is very important that Ukraine is in an accelerated mode, building up its rehab system. And that is um, very much what Olha was also alluding, brings me to the second point. It's about the capacity building. Uh, one is on the job capacity building. The other one is really work with universities because rehabilitation and physical rehabilitation, it's a long-term need. Having, talking to some of the patients, uh, you understand that they have long-term needs, but at the same time, they are um, ready when they they have been able to walk and, and move. And also, we should not think about physical rehabilitation only because of war. When I was in Poltava a few months ago, uh, there are a number of patients with stroke who are learning again how to eat, who are learning again how to walk, who are learning how to uh, have their life. So uh, physical rehabilitation is not something which is only because of war or you have lost a limb. We have many of the chronic conditions and strokes and heart attacks and others 
which all need rehabilitation. Uh, the same is with the spinal cord injuries. So I think that is an important that we um, support the knowledge exchange, knowledge and, and, and have a longer term response to this one. And one aspect, because I already in written way responded on mental health, uh, a few questions and operational plan, what is there available. But in our teams, as we are doing a lot of the bench trainings on the rehab, it is very important that in the early days, we see this interconnectivity to the mental health, because those who have rehabilitation needs, they need to be supported also in the mental health and how they go back in home, how to, to ensure um, and that they have also um, uh, ability for everyday life so, and, and how they are supported. And, and all of this brings me to the final point, as I have the microphone, is the key word is a tolerance and how we ensure that the society really accepts many who have rehabilitation needs and uh, that we are building a different society where a person with a wheelchair is unfortunate reality but um, we um, need to see everybody equal around us. So I think that's why uh, I know the patients of Ukraine is also working on many of those aspects to bring the human perspective into this. So very often we over medicalize it. I just wanted to say that it needs the whole society approach as we are recovering. Back to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Olga, do you want to add quickly on this point before we hand over to the discussion? Yeah, yeah. I want to add just uh, a very important point about uh, rehabilitation system at all. Uh, it is uh, really important to say that we do not need uh, large rehabilitational centers in every small town, every village, every city, but we need uh, the network of uh, sometimes even one uh, specialist, uh, even one person who is providing it, uh, but in the place where a patient lives, uh, where is uh, uh, his or her home uh, uh, based. Uh, so we are working also on this, uh, not to build a large one like a, a high candle, uh, rehabilitation centers, but uh, to make uh, a network of lots, lots, lots of spots of uh, rehabilitation, uh, um, uh, rehabilitation spots. Yes, and I'm, I'm <coughs> sure that uh, Katharina and uh, and Mark will come back to this issue, broader issue of um, of prioritization and what 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 we need, and perhaps also reflect. Also, uh, on something that was striking me, the, the role of a private sector, the role of a charitable sector in the reconstruction. So I hand it over to Katerina and Mark for their reflection and the lessons learned, also building on the other case studies in the report. And then we can have a, another broader um, round of discussions and question and answer. Thank you, over to you. Yeah, thanks, Maria. Um, so I think what I'll do is, um... I'll just set out a few key points really based really on the on the presentations that we've just heard um, and some of the really interesting insights that come come through those presentations. Um, we've got further information about these cases and also a couple of other cases in the report that Katerina has linked to in the chat box. Um, and Katerina is co-author of that report is going to be available to address some questions as well in the Q&A. Uh, but just some sort of um, uh, points from me at this point, reflecting on these really interesting presentations and cases. Um, to start with Jano, I mean, I think Jano gave us a flavor of really the extraordinary resilience of the Ukrainian health system in the context of what are really unprecedented challenges. Um, the Ukrainian health system is functioning. Access to health care has generally been sustained. And not only that, but it's also going through this historically significant reform program, and that has been continued throughout the wartime period. And it's progressing towards UHC, universal health coverage, through that process. And it's also rebuilding. It's also getting this process of health sector recovery underway. So this is an incredibly inspiring process. I think Marina and all her presentations highlight a number of important points about that process. So most obviously, most evidently from the presentation, you know, health sector recovery is already underway at this point. These are projects which are happening now. Many of them are being completed. 
Many of them are ongoing. So the government of Ukraine, the people of Ukraine, they're not waiting until the war is over to get on with this recovery process. Recovery has been initiated really as territory has been reclaimed from Russian military occupation. And that process is going to continue. And there are many examples, we've seen two of them, of successful, impactful projects out there. And we can learn from these. And of course, these things can also be scaled up dramatically if there is appropriate, adequate international support for them. So this is a message that I think the international community has been hearing at recent conferences like the Ukraine Recovery Conference in London in June, but it's something that it needs to continue to pay attention to. Um, another point, I think, is that these recovery projects, which are successful, which are having an impact, they are being led by Ukrainian organizations. So, you know, obviously among Ukrainian organizations is the state, you know, the Ministry of Health and other governmental actors. They're playing the leading role uh, and they're setting the framework within which these recovery efforts are being implemented. Uh, the government of Ukraine's established a number of platforms to fundraise, coordinate and steer funding for recovery. So the United 24 initiative of the president is one example. There's a national recovery agency. There's a national recovery plan. Um, so the state is there and it's leading. It's playing this kind of absolutely critical strategic role. But we are also seeing that within this recovery process, a number of different stakeholders are being involved, you know, and this, I think, demonstrates the kind of the, the sort of emerging and growing unity um, of, of Ukrainian civil society in this context. So we have philanthropic foundations like the KSC Foundation. We have NGOs and civil society organizations like Patients of Ukraine playing a really fundamental leadership role here, an important coordinating role raising money, of course, but also ensuring that this money is channeled to projects of the highest priority. Um, a third point, I think, is that one thing that we see here, and Jano touched on this point as well, is that, you know, many of the projects which have the potential for the greatest social return, if you like, are quite small scale. So, you know, at the aggregate level, Obviously, the level of investment needed for health sector recovery is very, very considerable. I think, you know, over health, you know, over a thousand healthcare sites have been attacked. There's been this huge damage, um, huge destruction, and the investment need associated with that is very substantial. But at the individual project level, the investment need is often quite modest. It's often quite small scale. And yet these small scale investments can often generate very significant benefits. And this is especially the case in a context like Ukraine, where the health system really is moving towards a much more primary care oriented service delivery model. That's very much an important part of the, re the structural reforms to the health system, which are currently underway. And so it is legitimate and indeed desirable that much of the investment that is gonna be flowing to Ukraine is going to be focused quite rightly on the PHC level. And I think that's gonna be a major challenge for international donors, including the multilateral banks, both now and in the post-war environment, because what we need to ensure is that the capital, the money is flowing to where it's most needed. And very often that's gonna be projects associated with you know, relatively small scale investments in primary care. Uh, some of the big multilateral banks they may struggle with that. They have big transaction costs. So they're looking for relatively large scale individual projects. They're gonna to have to find a way of bringing those together, aggregating those so that they're financing whole programs of investment in primary care rather than individual projects. So that's gonna require some new thinking among the international community and within the multilateral banks in particular about how that process can occur, how that process of aggregation can occur. Um, finally, I think just a sort of a broader r reflection, picking up on some of the themes in the presentations, but also my own sort of observations working with the WHO country office in recent years, including during the wartime period. Um, I think it seems to me that, you know, in the context of conflict and indeed 
other emergencies, we often talk about building back better. And we've seen a couple of examples of building back better in the in the concrete sense of bricks and mortar, you know, reconstruction, restoration of physical infrastructure. And of course, in Ukraine, there is a huge need uh, to do that because of the scale of the damage and destruction. But there's also, as Jano said, this need to ensure that what is rebuilt in terms of bricks and mortar actually supports the service delivery objectives that have been set by the government of Ukraine and the Ministry of Health in particular, which in common with many other health systems with a Shemasko, Shemasko legacy is, you know, about strengthening primary care capacity, streamlining capacity in terms of specialist outpatient and inpatient care. And recovery efforts really need to support that and the international community needs to be aware of that. But what I observe in Ukraine is that, and I think this also came through Marina on all her presentations, that the con the concept of building back better has this kind of broader meaning in Ukraine. This is very evident when you work with people in Ukraine, because building back better in this context is is about restoring hope. You know, so and Olha, you mentioned this explicitly, you know, restoring the viability of communities, encouraging people to return to communities, enabling them to do so, because it's only possible for people to return if there's the social infrastructure there to support that return. But also, I think looking at the recovery plan as it relates to the health sector, you also see strong themes here about building social trust, you know, operationalizing, realizing a kind of new social contract in the country. Because in the context of this war, and this is a war we should remember that really began in 2014, albeit it's intensified with the full scale Russian invasion of 2022. You know, what's really evident is that institutions of social trust are actually strengthened. That sense of national unity in Ukraine has actually strengthened over this period. And the literature is quite clear on this. So the impetus behind the creation of an open, transparent, liberal democracy in Ukraine is growing. Trust in the state and across society is growing. State capacity is growing. Democratic institutions are strengthening. The unity in the country is increasing. And I think what we're starting to see in this broader category of recovery is that politically difficult things are being done. So we see new, to new anti tobacco legislation, for example, facing down the lobbyists, new public health laws, much greater device uh, decisiveness in dealing with corruption, taking really politically difficult decisions to streamline the hospital network. All of these things are incredibly difficult for any government to do under any nor normal circumstances. And in Ukraine, the inspiring thing is that they're happening in wartime. So for all these reasons, I think Ukraine's example of recovery, clearly it's an inspiring one. It's also one that needs to be studied very carefully, I think, obviously by those who are working in Ukraine um, and for those with a professional interest in health system strengthening in other conflict affected settings, but also by not just among researchers, but by um, everybody with a stake in public health, in the health sector, in health systems that has a different country focus and is really interested in finding out more about what it really takes and what it really means to build back better in this sense. Um, OK, and with that, I think I'll hand over to Goran or to Maria. I don't know, Katrina, do you want to add anything to this? And I saw your um, your reply on, on the question about resilience and uh, the enabling factors of resilience in, in Ukraine. And maybe you want to expand on that briefly, um, since we have a little bit more time, I think. Uh, thank you. Uh, yes, uh, about that question, but overall about what we heard today, I think it's very important uh, to realize that um the war <laughs> is happening on the backdrop if you may say of a massive health reform that ukraine has been uh, developing since 2016 and the the big health reform law adopted in 2017 and 
a lot of this enabled the resilience, but even, for example, talking about the case studies, a lot of this also enabled the recovery because, for example, both of the facilities that we talked today, that had, they have been restored by the private funding, but their operational expenses are financed by the public budget, a new national single purchaser that was established through the reform and the new capitation payment for the primary health care, which before this wouldn't have been possible and then the question arises of how to ensure the sustainability of the projects that are, are being uh, restored or, or the recovery activities and so this is a very good example of how um, different uh, players have different roles in the in the recovery of Ukrainian health sector so there is the government who has definitely the role of coordination and leading because also we talked about increased need in mental health increased need in in the uh, rehabilitation and also we saw that many stakeholders are involved everybody presenting today is mentioned how they're involved in rehabilitation how they're involved in mental health support but also many people mentioned that we're only covering certain percentage of the need the need is big a lot of players are involved so there is also a, a big role for the government on coordination and also uh, us as international development partners supporting them with uh, aligning different different actions uh, but there's also a role for private sector for example on investing in the recovery because the other case we did not cover today is on pharmacies which is traditionally a uh, private sector but it's also very important that they cooperate with the government program on uh, the substitution uh, um, subsidies for the outpatient medicines um and and so on and we also talked about the role for universities of training the capacities of of the future um uh, physiotherapists but not only and so it's so important to realize that in such a complex process every actor has a role uh, and this uh, health system reform that is ongoing um involves everybody <laughs> so this is not only a public sector reform as uh, there is a role for everybody and we see increasing and increasing participation of civil society of uh, private service providers of uh, universities uh, and and so on and uh, we really hope to see that within the recovery this cooperation becomes even tighter and stronger uh, together thank you thank you thank you this is uh, to me is very very interesting point and i think um, also, you know, thinking about experiences in other countries, the coordination is always the big challenge. And I, I, I agree with Mark, this is a very unique case where everybody's kind of working in the same direction. Um, and uh, and again, perhaps to, to put an open question, what, what do you think are the key mechanisms for coordination? You mentioned the government, but there are any kind of platforms are in, how, how does this coordination happen? And how, uh, you know, how can everything kind of be uh, linked together and and go in the same direction be aligned also to the priorities of the countries from the small scale projects the charity funding and external funding that you know sometimes is very difficult to control to to the big banks and the big uh, lenders that mark was mentioning i don't know if any anyone of the panelists wants to take this this question is really interesting to me and quite fascinating and different from other countries maybe maybe i start and and um i i like to thank mark also for uh courage because not every researcher wants to uh, 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 run to uh, all, all to Kharkiv or any other places to see how actually recovery matters. So I really like to thank also Mark, but the research community who is coming and documenting uh, now what is happening uh, because we need to learn those lessons. And Maria, that's a good question. Uh, how we coordinate. I, I think um, I have been doing coordination working in WH more than 20 years. That's my bread and butter. And I, I cannot answer you exactly because I, I think there is a there are many platforms and there is no ideal coordination. But then what has happened in the last 18 months is that there is some common sense and resilience that has come in um, and more unity within Ukraine what needs to happen. It is not that everybody agrees with everything, but there is a more of that type of discussion around um, uh, and how to get everything coordinated. And I think there are a few of the elements which would help us in health sector. And this is the Minister of Health and the government leadership to have Health 2030 strategy in place, because we need to have a vision where we are going with the reforms and some of the roadmap. So Ukraine is not waiting 
until um, the war is over one day. And what Mark was mentioning also, we are marking next year basically 10 years of the war, not two years. So uh, that would mean that Ukraine is not waiting. It sets and tries to set the long-term strategies. And then those long-term strategies need to be translated to the local level. And then another aspect is, I think that we set the long-term vision that, and also that we talk about the recovery. When I go back to Lugano discussions last year, what I had opportunity to attend, the, the feeling was that we should wait until we discuss about recovery. The main change when I talked in the corridors to the policymakers in London is that recovery is already happening. Let's get, let's live with it and let's get, use it in the best possible way. And I think what we will learn in the next couple of years is what is the way to coordinate it. And there um, will be uh, mistakes made. There will be also lessons learned. And then there will be a lot of adjustments because Today, I spent already half an hour in shelter. Last night, I spent one hour in shelter. The missiles and the drones are continuing to come. The healthcare facilities are continuing to be attacked. It takes a lot of resilience to recover already now. And we need to be extremely agile how we do respond and recover. So I, I think that coordination also um, um, needs um, um, that element that there is no ideal plan. We don't know where, what Olha was mentioning also is that yes, we need number of rehab centers because people want to go back home, but where they can go back home, it's another aspect we need to look into that as well. And, and how quickly they can go back home and how quickly can they can be uh, having everyday life there. So I think uh, coordination is a key, but I, I would say also agility. Um, mm -hmm. and, and there, I think um, uh, all of this, it needs to build on trust. And mm -hmm. one of the aspects, what we need to ensure is that we don't break the trust. And addressing mm -hmm. corruption is extremely important. Mm -hmm. The reforms in 15, 16, 17, they started to address the corruption that Ukrainians didn't agree with. Now we should not allow the corruption to kick in. And that's why it's very, very important as a principle. And then we, uh, if that this trust is kept, then the recovery is also healthy. Sorry that I bring this additional topic in, but it's a very, very important because otherwise we might sometimes be a very technocratic how to build the perfect primary care centers, how the future hospital will look like, what are the health needs to address, how to do the health technology assessment. But I think to have a trust of people, that's even the more important. And that is something that we need to keep and ensure that people have that trust when they go back home and they see that they have healthcare workers. And finally, I think the coordination on, around human capital is extremely important because we see a lot of the healthcare workers who have left Ukraine, many of them for various reasons have settled in their new places and, uh, as well to ensure that their children can have uh, education and many of the reasons. But how to ensure that we have enough human capital in Ukraine to provide services, um, that is also extremely important. And the human capital is formed both from the people and the healthcare workers. So I, I think that is ahead of us as a key topic for the next five years. And that's much more difficult to coordinate compared to the physical infrastructure. Right? So I think a lot to learn, but also um, I think through this type of webinars, we need to generate ideas how to move forward because I think agility is the key word we need to learn from this. Back to you. Thank you, thank you, Jarno. Very fascinating and interesting and, and, and thought-provoking discussion and reflection. I think this linking linking the technocratic and the how do we do this to the to the human side, the human capital, and also the trust, what Mark was saying about some sort of windows of opportunity for political decision-making opening because there is increased trust, because there is a sense of urgency. This is uh, This is fascinating and it's not only about uh, as you said, how do we build a, a PHC um, system that works, but it's also about how do we get the people back, both the health workers and the communities and that sense of communities building on that. So that is really, and, 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 and the word hope that was mentioned before, I think that's also obviously very, very important. Um, Holga, back to you if, um, for your thoughts and reflections on that. 
Uh, I want wanted to add something about coordination and maybe show you our experience in our project. Uh, it is maybe look like small project in uh, um, uh, if we look uh, on uh, the whole country, but it's really large uh, when uh, we look uh, at uh, all scope of work. Uh, we were choosing among 100, more than 100 healthcare facilities, and of course, coordination with uh, local governments, with uh, country government, and uh, uh, among other uh, non-governmental organization is very important. Was very important in this process. Um, first, I want to mention that in Ukraine, it's uh, like an old tradition, like as uh, like a, an uh, old um, uh, characteristic uh, of Ukrainians. Uh, there is often uh, much more coordination in horizontal level, but not vertical from up to down. And uh, it is uh, our secret of sustainability. It's how we survived uh, also in this war because of our horizontal links and horizontal coordinations. Uh, and it's really important. And about uh, choosing uh, where resources are more important now, uh, how we choose uh, uh, um, projects, uh, healthcare facilities, uh, which to rebuild, which to repair in our project. Uh, first, we checked uh, uh, if there are any people, patients of healthcare facility living there right now in the start of the project. And then we checked staff, if there are any staff, nurses, uh, doctors there. Uh, then uh, we have uh, our security team and they checked uh, if uh, Russian army is far enough or if they're at least uh, 50 kilometers uh, with their um, um, weapons uh, which can uh, uh, injure and destroy uh, just rebuild healthcare facility. Uh, and uh, then we communicated with uh, uh, local uh, people and uh, local managers of uh, that healthcare facilities to understand uh, how urgent is their needs. And uh, uh, also we told uh, every one of them uh, while we are making our assessment, um, it is really quick, but still we told uh, to every manager of uh, Hromada or uh, healthcare facility uh, to uh, keep in touch, to connect all sources uh, they uh, can and uh, to ask about help. And when we know that we can come and start uh, our works right now, we checked uh, the uh, status of that healthcare facility again. And uh, not to um, overlap uh, our um, work uh, with other organization. We, uh, for example, uh, we had situation when we had to replace roof windows and uh, doors and walls, but other organization came and did it. And we came and replaced, for example, heating system or water supply system. And it's uh, such cooperation of different organizations. We're not doing the same work. We are doing different work in the same place uh, to uh, enforce it. So it's about uh, coordination and cooperation. It is often very horizontal. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Olga. That's, yeah, that's very interesting again, and it gives uh, other insights. And also, yeah, in terms of duplications, that's often, often <laughs> something to worry about. Um, I don't know if there are um, any other panelists that want to address some of the questions. Most of the questions um, online have been answered. So thank you very much to everybody typing away um, your answers and your thoughts. And um, there's one more question um, on hardware and software components and trust and value. I think we touched quite a bit on that. Um, Jarno, do you want to um, say something briefly before we hand over to Goran for concluding thoughts? I, I, I just wanted to uh, mention that exactly. I, I think 
we have today discussed a little bit more on the hardware because these are the needs now as well in the short run and we discussed about 16.4 billion but i think this soft side is even more important and uh, this is exactly the networking ensuring what we saw and and uh, when there was a need of course uh, after the kahovka dam um, explosion and uh, what we saw in Kherson, that we actually had more than 100 healthcare workers in back in Saporoje and in Kherson working, and it was mobilized. So it's not only about the physical infrastructure, it's all the soft sides as well. And then there, I, I think we need to realize that Ukraine was really, um, and is on the, on the good track when it comes to transparency and e-health. I think that's another element, which is part of that and all the institutions which are there. So I think these um, more so-called softer components um, um, have been have been uh, important. But also, um, if you, um, uh, and I shouldn't do advertisement, but uh, if you visit the WHO site or any other sites, but in our sites, we have also monitored exactly how health financing system has adapted in an innovative and a flexible way to respond to the war. And that's also an important. And uh, then with Mark, we have been looking and Katya exactly how the private sector has been reacting. And there, one thing is also how the pharmacy network was working and still how it is adapting, especially close to the contact line or how the supply lines are working. So I think there are many of those elements. And as the war continues, we still see how this adaptation goes or in the last winter, when we had, uh, since 10th of October, attacks on energy infrastructure, how to ensure that the generators are in place. And uh, I must say, I have learned a lot about generators, diesel, and how uh, different size of generators are working together, not only about sounds of all of them, but also how to get actually them to connect it to the healthcare um, system, or, and so on. So I think this um, there is a lot uh, of, the other health system components. But I want to say what war has teached, at least for me, is that these six components are important. But when we analyze the health systems and its six components, we actually don't look to the environment, both of overall environment and other sectors, and also the political environment, et cetera, et cetera. So what war has teached us is when we look to the six components, and I have been doing health system works for years, where is actually discussion about technical water? Where is the discussion about chip of the computer? Where is the discussion uh, about demining the primary care center? So I think our six components of health system and what we analyze, even uh, that is too little when we analyze the war impact to health in Ukraine, for example, and uh, this political environment, broader environment, the need of the electricity, water, many of the other, other aspects for health system to function, they are even something that we don't every day realize because uh, usually our health systems are not under such stress as it has been functioning in Ukraine last 18 months. So I think we, for war adaptation, we need to think outside of the box of uh, some people call four functions, uh, some have six functions. It depends what year of the WHO guidance we look at, but we need to go even beyond that. And I, I think there are a lot of lessons to learn. So I call also our uh, colleagues and researchers and thinkers to think beyond the, our usual framework as well, because there are lessons to be learned from Ukraine and that is extremely valuable for Ukraine in the war. But these are exactly important lessons learned if you need to respond, if you have landslide in country X later on, because these are the vulnerabilities which are there for health systems for many of the other crises. Back to you, Maria and Goran, and thank you for all the panelists and the opportunity to learn. Thank you. Thank you, Jarno, for these reflections. I think for me, at least, it, this webinar was really great. And in discussing exactly in thinking about infrastructure as an entry point, but then we touched on social institution, on trust, on hope, on communities, and how to bring back uh, the, the health workers, the communities themselves. So that is really what is the health system is not only about the, the windows and the generator, although those are essential, but it's really about what, what keeps them all together. 
So thank you. That was uh, really, really interesting. Um, and I hand it over to Goran for some concluding thoughts, also from the perspective of HSG Europe. Thank you, everybody. Thanks again. Thank you so much, Maria. Thank you. I don't know if you could hear me well. Can you hear me? Fantastic. Uh, I mean, wow, what a fascinating story of resilience, of hope, of, um, I mean, everything is inspiring. And I am really humbled, and I'm sure everybody on the um, uh, on the webinar is, is feeling the same. Um, there are a number of things that are, um, you know, related to me, both, both personally as well as professionally. And I'm sure to HSG as well. Personally, I am originally uh, I'm Kurdish from northern Iraq. I was a healthcare provider during the war uh, and after the war in 2003. So I relate with the difficulties that you are going through, and I, um, I, I, I thank you for, from the bottom of, of, of my heart. As I'm sure every patient, every person in Ukraine is for the amazing work that you and everyone is doing. Uh, so thank you for that. But also professionally, all of the questions that you raised from the window, from the broken window to the diesel generator, to the uh, uh, to the donors, to the uh, coordination, the challenges with um, uh, 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 funding and financing, as Mark was, was, was saying, uh, this is fascinating. This is something that we can all learn from. And I'm sure that HSG, Health System Global, both at the Europe level and the global level, is ready to learn from you. And, and Yarno, I, I, I assure you that as health researchers, we are coming running uh, to learn from this. And uh, so just to let you know that next year, in, in the, uh, on the 18th of, of November to the 22nd of November, we'll have the eighth Global Symposium on Health Policy and System Research. Uh, it will be in Nagasaki, in Japan. Uh, there is a conflict theme uh, uh, attached to that uh, for obvious uh, region, reasons related to geography, but also the theme of the of the symposium, the next year's symposium, is about building or rebuilding health systems or just health systems um, uh, while centering people and um, uh, protecting the planet. So I go back to uh, August. Um, mentioning of people, of people-centeredness and the, the, the spirit and uh, and trying to rebuild the social contract um, and in, in trying to also capitalize on the uh, on the new social contract and and uh, and the enthusiasm from you know national and local level. So to conclude, I think unfortunately we are going through a, a world that is um, plagued with a, a, the level of multiple levels of crises. Uh, conflict, climate crisis, financial crisis, you name it. But as uh, Yarno and Katrina and, uh, and Marina beautifully demonstrated, crisis is an opportunity. We can rebuild. We can continue the recovery process while the crisis is ongoing. And we learned that from um, conflict uh, situation after conflict situation, including my own uh, country of, of, of Iran. So, um, Finally, I want to thank you again. Uh, thank you so much for sharing those fascinating, humbling, uh, inspiring stories. And I'm looking forward uh, to seeing you in Japan, hopefully. But before that, we have a con we have a pre conference. We will organize a pre conference for Europe. Um, and I'm sure that uh, Ukraine and the conflict uh, affected situation in Ukraine will be a central theme in that pre conference. We will get in touch uh, with more details about that in due course. But for the meantime, thank you so much and uh, looking forward to seeing you. Thank you, Goran. Thanks, everybody. And I hope uh, that, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a conversation that started and hope to hear from you soon and, and see you again. Thanks to our audience as well today. Bye. Bye, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye.